Merry Christmas. You know, um, we're starting this, uh, as Greg said, this new series today, and I have to tell you that when I think about simple Christmas, that's almost like an oxymoron, meaning that uh, the word simple and Christmas going together doesn't seem to fit in the way that we often do it. It seems like those are two contradictory terms, and, and so... Uh, our goal this Christmas is to say, hey, um, doing things the world's way is complicated and exhausting. What if we were to try something different? You know, I was, uh, I was thinking about Christmas and, and what makes it difficult. One of the things I think makes it difficult is expectations that you have to try to fulfill. I think about, uh, it's, it's a lot of hard work to find the perfect present for every single person that will change their life forever. <laughs> that's a lot of pressure. Uh, if that's your view of things, man, that's, that's difficult. That's hard to do. I think about uh, uh, food. You know, there's always got to be food. And to, to find the right kind of food that makes everybody happy. That's a difficult one, too. I don't know about you guys. If I were to say, hey, where do we want to go to lunch today to my family? It would be 16 different places. Very difficult. You know, I, I think about um, the relational complexities of Christmas. I mean, even in a, every regular family's got their issues, and, and, and there's complexities that are built in. I think about my family. I have three sons. Uh, they're all married to three wonderful ladies in this area, and they all have their families. So how do I, how do we have Christmas with my boys and their family, but at the same time, they all have wives. How do they do it there? Then there's my family, my parents. How do we uh, negotiate that? Is it like three breakfast, lunch, and dinner Christmas day? I mean, how, how are we going to do that? And then you, you throw in work and, you know, uh, I only have so much time because, you know, Christmas Eve, I'm going to be here. How many of you are going to be here Christmas Eve? You know, like, I don't know, 10 times that weekend I'll be here. How do you, how do, you do that? And, and uh, then there's other complexities too. If you're a blended family, well, now it's not just, you know, one on each side. It's like multiple, and, and that gets difficult. And, and then trying to arrange Christmas for that. And then what happens when you have people in your family that don't like each other? You know, it's that time of year where everybody gets together, and, like, there's some people, you're like, yeah, that's going to cause, there's going to be tension. How do, how do I keep the peace uh, with, with everybody involved? And then... Then there's the whole, um, the loneliness piece. For those, you know, a lot of times Christmas is all about you're supposed to have this kind of family and it's supposed to be like this, but what happens when you don't have that kind of family? What happens when you think about family? It's painful. What happens when somebody's lost? They're not here anymore. And so it changes Christmas. A mother, a father, a child, brother, or sister. It can be painful. And then you've got the financial aspect. I mean, how are you going to, I mean, find everybody with the perfect present and, and then spending the equal amount of money with all of them. How do you financially do that uh, when the economy is difficult? And so do, do you just use all your savings? Do you not pay bills? Or you use your credit card? And then you've got the stress that this, uh, it's stressful enough Christmas, that, but it carries over sometimes too in trying to pay off all that stuff that, that was going to change their life that they played for, with for five minutes and then moved on. Boy, I'm depressing today. <laughs> right? I mean, the truth is, though, it is exhausting to celebrate Christmas the way we currently do it. Manage all those expectations. You know, I was thinking... You do know that God is kind of the author of celebration. Um, sometimes we think, well, then we're not going to celebrate it. We're not going to do this. We're going to just get rid of it all. Uh, you know, no, I think there is something to celebrate here, and, and God thinks so too. Celebrations are God's idea. If you go to the Old Testament, um, you remember the story in Genesis? It ends with 
jo uh, Joseph being in Egypt, and he's second in command. But as time goes by, the Egyptians are threatened by the numbers of, of uh, Israelites, and they make them slaves. And then it gets really rough, and then God sends Moses to these people. And remember, he had said to Abraham years before, through you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. You're going to have all kinds of people in your family, and it's going to become a nation. And yet, these folks really don't know what it's like to be their own nation. They're more like the Egyptians or the culture than they are God's people. They don't even know what it looks like to be God's people until Moses comes. And God uses Moses and, and directly to do miracles. Uh, God did miracles, and he frees the Israelites from Egypt. And, and as he takes them across the sea and they go on their journey to the promised land, God comes alongside and he says, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to show you how to be a new kind of people. I've chosen you out of the world. You look more like the Egyptians. Now you're going to be my people. And so he sets up a tabernacle. And he, and he starts to show them what it looks like to worship a holy and good God. There, there's a law that he gives. And every one of those laws is designed to move from chaos to caring about God and caring about others. They're, they're, these are the things you do and you don't do. And, and he, he even changes the way they eat to much healthier version of, uh, of eating. And, he, and he, he gives them a Sabbath day rest. They were slaves. Now he gives them rest. And he, and, and he, he creates these ceremonies, these celebrations in the Jewish culture. You've got the Day of Atonement once a year, the Passover, the festival of booze, Pentecost. I mean, you go down the line, there are all of these celebrations. And, and, and God even says, listen, I'm, when you come into your house, I'm gonna, we're going to put reminders and all kinds of things in your life that make you a different kind of people. Now, as you get to the book of Deuteronomy, they're now moving through this training period where God's making them into a nation and setting up ceremonies and, and religious practices. Now they're going into the promised land. If you have your Bibles, look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. As they get ready, they're moving from the journey to the promised land. Now they're going in and they're going to be God's people, God's new nation, new authority structure. Everything's new. He says this in chapter 6, verse 1. These are the commands and decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So all this is set up. You're going to go into this new land. He says, verse 2, so that, notice this, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord God as long as you live by keeping all the decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. All right, so you're getting this idea. He says, listen, you're gonna go in here, you're gonna observe these commands, and I want you to do this so that your children have long life, that they have a good life. These commands I've given you are for your good. They're gonna make you different than everybody else in the world, but they're for your good. Notice what he says, verse three. Hear Israel and be careful to obey that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. So he's talking to the parents, to the grandparents, to the adults. They're to be upon your heart. Then verse seven, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In other words, Talk about it, eat and sleep about it. It's on your houses, you're marked by it so that it'll go well for you. But now, I want you to notice as you go through Deuteronomy, he's then saying this, you're gonna go into this promised land, but when you go into the promised land, you're gonna face some enemies. If you get to Deuteronomy chapter eight, he says this, when you go into this land and you live in houses that you did not build, 
and you eat food that you did not plant, when you go and live in the blessing, I'm going to push these folks out because of their evil behavior. I'm going to give you a new land. When you get there, look out. He says this, be careful. That is the time to be careful. When? When you're eating and you're drinking and you're, you got your houses. That is the time to be careful because you will say in your heart that you did this with your own hands. It was by your own strength. Here's what he's saying to them. First enemy you're going to face when you go into this promised land is an internal enemy, and it's pride. When you get into the land, you're going to become proud as though you thought this up yourself, as though you thought up, as though you worked for all of this. And he goes on to say, it is the Lord God who gives you the ability to work and to acquire wealth. Don't forget God. I, I, can, I can just tell you this. It's so interesting what happens when people get prosperous. They forget where they came from. They forget what God has done. They start to take credit for it. They start to give the credit to the wrong kinds of people. And uh, they rewrite history or just ignore it. You know, I, I want you to understand this, that he's giving these laws and these commands which include celebrations, commanded celebrations. To help them remember, he says, you need to remember as you go into this world, people are prone to forget. And what they once worshiped, they worship something new, a God that they create with their own hands. They, 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 they're prosperous enough to build something they like and then that takes over. That becomes the point. And then, then it just becomes an empty celebration. I think about in our country, I mean, just s some examples. Do you remember when 4th of July had something to do up with America and now it's become fireworks day? Or Thanksgiving used to be that God uh, used the Native Americans to help uh, the, the, the pilgrims get through the winter and now it's oppressor's day? It's bad enough that we've rejected all, now it's turkey and foot. No, it's bad enough we rejected the beginning. We've actually villainized the very people we used to learn about and want to emulate. There was an inner enemy, but that wasn't the only enemy. He says, when you go into this land, be careful that the people around you will entice you by the way they live. By the way, those, those people were uh, following false gods who demanded things like child sacrifice, like temple prostitution, where, for children, where you, were, you had to dedicate your own child to the temple to be used for sex for a year. When God said, you go into here, these people will celebrate and they will, they will do all kinds of things that will be enticing to you. Be careful. Remember. Teach your children to remember. They're going to have a culture that's built around celebrating the wrong things. So you're to have the Lord God be first and you're to impress this on their children because they have an internal pride enemy. But they also have a, a culture that entices and distracts and distorts. But then he closes when he says, hey, these false gods that they worship are actually demons. Demonic forces represented by these idols. So not only do you have an internal enemy, not only do you have a cultural enemy, you actually have a spiritual enemy. That it's not, it's not going to be a live and let live sort of a thing. The people who are being led by these demonic forces are not going to be just okay with you doing your thing. No, that the enemy is always attacking the righteous. He will never just let you be. So you have to have your children ready when they get into this culture. And that's what the laws and the commands and the celebrations were all about. These rhythms in life, the weekly rhythms of Sabbath, where you spend time with God, the, the, the national celebrations, the lifestyles, all of it designed around people and the needs of people to remember because we so quickly forget. You get to the New Testament. Um, you might say, well, yeah, okay, the New Testament, Jesus comes, the Old Testament prophesied, the Messiah comes, 
And, you know, now we don't need celebrations anymore, except for, no, that's not what the Bible actually says. You do know that the church gathered together on the first day of the week as a regular rhythm of celebration. In fact, one of the celebrations we'll do in a little bit is that's what communion actually was. God, oh, we had the Holy Spirit, we have the Word of God. People are still people. We still have an internal enemy. We still have a cultural enemy. We still have a spiritual enemy. Uh, we have a celebrations in the New Testament that were weekly. In fact, it was the Passover meal. When, which was celebrated once a year where Jesus actually took bread and broke it and, and, and he said, this is my body given for you. And he took, and he, he said, he took this celebration at Passover and said, no, now there's a new covenant in my blood. And, and the early church started meeting once a week to celebrate Communion was a part of the early church's meetings. In fact, many times, multiple times a week. Why did they center on this communion sort of celebration and remembrance? Again, people forget. The early church had different kinds of things that they would celebrate. Easter. They would celebrate Christmas. Now, at first, it was underground because it was illegal, but when Constantine comes around and he, he says, now Christianity is legal, and so they started having a celebration. In fact, the first nationwide, kind of worldwide Christian celebration started in 336. It's called Christ Mass. Mass being a, a, the, sort of the version of the church coming together centered on Christ. And, and why'd they do that? Well, they were celebrating the birth of the Savior. And it was really very simple. It was really very simple. It became one of those times in a year. You had communion weekly, but it was one of those times in the year that they, they recognized the truth that the king of heaven took a human body and came down. God the son was sent by God the father to come and reveal the heart of God to you and me. The condition that he saw us in. Oh, I'm as good as that person, or I'm, I'm pretty good, I'm, I, we're, we're a good people, and God said, let me just tell you your condition. Your condition is you're in darkness, you're confused. Oh, you're used to it, it's normal for you, but that's not how I created you. You're dying, you're using all kinds of things to cope. The life is empty, it's an empty way of life handed down to us, scripture says. It's not what we were created for. Christmas was to reveal very simply Easter was to reveal very simply that we are in need of a savior and God was willing to give one at his own expense. As you walk through Christmas, you know, over time, um, you know, they, 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 it wasn't okay with things being simple, so they started to add some, some things to it. And, and again, uh, they chose Christmas Day that we have currently. Because they, they didn't know that what day Jesus was born, probably born more in the spring. But it was like, hey, there, it, it, we don't know the day, so we could pick any day because we, we don't know what's for sure, but we're going to celebrate it. And they chose a day, that, a day when most everybody else was celebrating the, spring, you know, the, uh, the, the Christmas season and it, it, or a season that was uh, kind of celebratory but as the winter came to the end and, or it actually started and so they just chose a day and it doesn't really matter what day they were going to celebrate the day and, and it started out with this Christ mass but then you know they started going you know what let's add a little of this and let's, let's add a little of that and a lot of it's not, not a problem I mean listen no big deal they, but they took a tree that was more of a pagan thing and they went we're going to dress it up and, and we're going to make it we're going to Christian it, which I have no problem with. I mean, the pagans do all kinds of stuff. Let's take it and let's make it, let's center it on Jesus. And so we did. And, and that's fine. It's great. The lights, they, they did that too. And, it, and here's the deal. If you ever wanted to know what those things mean as a Christian, you can go look it up. But, but, but oftentimes, 
like 4th of July becomes about the fireworks, Christmas becomes about the tree and the lights, and most people don't even talk about what those things actually mean from a Christian perspective. It, it, the Christmas tree is just for kids, it's where the presents sit. The light is to figure out whose house can be the most beautiful. It's so interesting to me that oftentimes we take the most simple things and we just keep adding and adding and adding and pretty soon the meaning, the true meaning can get lost. Well, some of us go, okay, well, you know what? You're right, and, and again, um, here's the deal, all service long I've been watching because I, the little kids right now are they're hearing where I'm going, they're, they're going, mom and dad, don't listen. I'm worried about getting kicked in the shins on the way out. Again, I'm not, a, presence, it's a good thing. In, in, in the festival of Purim in the Old Testament, it's a good thing. Nothing wrong with presence. But over time, the most important things can be lost if we don't slow down and take a deeper look. The reason we're doing this series right now is because Christmas comes, and it, you know, it's right as soon as Thanksgiving's over, we start down this ritual, we get on, a, on tracks, and we get right on them. It's what we've done every year, and every year at the end of the season, we're spent, we're exhausted, we're, we're, we're frustrated, we're like, I'm never gonna do it again, and then we just pack it all up, put it away, and then next year, before we even think about it, we don't, we're not intentional, we don't pause, what do we do? We get right back on those tracks that we said we'd never do again, hoping we'll get different results. We're not even thinking about the results at all. What does it look like to go, hold on a second? You know, one of the things that always has bugged me is, uh, you know how everybody was trying to say happy holidays now instead of Merry Christmas? We say Merry Christmas, don't we? Well, there, you know, there's a whole lot of people that go, it's Merry Christmas. But when you look at how they actually live out their Christmas, it should be happy holidays. Because though we call it Merry Christmas, it's about all the food and the presents and the going from house to house. And then some of us are like, well, we'll, we'll add some Jesus. We'll go to Christmas Eve service, right? But, or we'll, we'll read the story of Jesus. But I don't know if you've found this to be true. Like I, for me, if the tree is over there with all the presents under it, I can be reading Luke chapter 2, but all my grandkids are like, Can 300 hours of Christmas in the culture be counteracted by 15 minutes or even a Christmas Eve service? No, see, we, if it's about Jesus, it's about Christmas, it, we kind of set ourselves up for it. You know, the first question that a little kid is asked when Christmas comes is oftentimes, what do you want for Christmas? That's your first question that you hear. As you get older, you realize it's not just what I want, but I do want some stuff. What do you want? So it becomes this time where I'm trying to give you a present. You're trying to figure out what I want. It's all about you and me. But what if Christmas was about what does Jesus want? What does Jesus want it to be about? I mean, he gave us the event. He gave us something to celebrate. But what were we supposed to get out of it? And how do we counteract what the world is doing with it? Complicating it. Turning something that was supposed to bring light into something that brings frustration and exhaustion. What does God want for us? Every gift he ever gave, and this is the biggie, Jesus God the Son of the flesh, he gave it to us for a purpose. And it's not easy to get across to our families, to impress it upon, to, to have it be for us the center of our attention, let alone impressing this upon our kids. But right now, more than ever, they need it. We live in a world that's all about what I want or what somebody else wants. It's all human in nature. 
us trying to figure out how to make ourselves and other people happy. But unless we have a relationship with God, the Spirit of God, the people of God, unless we are walking in the light of relationship with him, it's just so meaningless and exhausting and empty. But when we walk with him, when we receive that present, when we spend time reflecting on what Christmas is all about, and when we impress it upon our children, it becomes a foundation block to be able to build our houses, our spiritual houses on, so that we can withstand storms and problems and economies and bad leaders. And because this world isn't all there is. What does Jesus want? Well, it's very clear. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says that his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, he, was, he created us to be with him, and his desire is to restore relationship with him. And so he has left heaven. He left God the Son. He was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why? The light came into the darkness. He came to present himself to us as a form of, I want to be in relationship with you, and he presented himself for who he truly is. And that's, that's, no, that's really kind of uh, highlighted in the Christmas story. Do you remember when the angels said to the shepherds, the shepherds were guarding their sheep at night in the dark. They weren't treated well by the culture. They were necessary, essential for all the ceremonies, but they were kind of pushed out, uh, stinky, smelly, you know, farmers out there that the rest of society didn't want anything to do with. And they're out there by themselves, excluded from most of the culture. And an angel of the Lord came and, and the glory of the Lord shone around him. And, and they were terrified. Why were they terrified? Well, because normally we just compare ourselves to other people. I'm as good as that shepherd. Well, I'm as good as, why aren't you? No, God just revealed himself through the angels and it, it shook them to their face. They were terrified in the presence of a holy God. And their problem became very clear. He's holy. They're holy. We're not. And the angel said, peace to you. Peace on earth. To whom his favor rests. And he said, Tonight, a savior has been born to you. God thinks we need to be saved. God thinks we need to be, God thinks we can't save ourselves. God thinks that I can't save my children by the perfect present or the perfect meal. God thinks that, that I couldn't handle the pressure, I couldn't fix it. Other people can't save me either. This human experience that we've turned it into, it doesn't save us. Every time we try to do it ourselves, it just makes a bigger mess. It's empty. God thinks we need a savior and he wants to save us. But he says, I'm not just coming to save you. He said, a, a, a savior is born to you. He is Christ the Lord, the Messiah. He is the king and he presents himself to us as savior so that he can lead us, Savior from our, our own way of doing things, saving, saving us from our own understanding. God says, listen, I want to save you from what we've created down here. So exhausting. But save us from the outcome of death and destruction and eternal separation. The message of Christmas for it to get, think about the depth of that. Think about the significance of that. It, 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 the theological truths in it, the relational truths in it, the most profound mystery in all of human history is being shrouded in silly little trinkets and presents and food. I'm, listen, I'm not against those things, but I'm saying we've lost the profound Clarity that we get in Christ Jesus that helps us to get through this broken world we live in. He is Christ the Lord. And no one will be saved apart from his saving. And no one will be saved who rejects his kingship in their lives. And so it's so important that we pause for a minute and go, what is this event we're celebrating? And with all the glitz and the, and the glamour and the, all the other stuff, 
what would it look like to ask ourselves some different questions this Christmas? Let me give you some questions, and I hope you'll be talking about this in your life groups and your small groups. The ideas that you can get, the things that you need to eliminate, the things that you can work with, you don't need to eliminate. Again, I'm, here's what I tell you, what I'm not telling you to do is, you know, go, this is about Jesus and I'm blowing up my mother-in-law's Christmas. Don't do that. You know, some of you don't run your own Christmases at your house. And you have to care about other people. So you need to pray, prayerfully go, how do I influence this? What part can I play with my kids? What part can I play with my grandkids that honors the other people around? But, but that I make the point that they know what I believe this story is really about is the most important thing in human history, in eternity. I'm also not adding you to go, some of you are going, oh great, I have to do the dinner, I gotta do all the presents, and now the gym's just piling one more thing on me. Here's a no, no, listen, in order to do this right, you're gonna have to exclude some things. You're gonna have to say no to some things. It's opportunity cost. You're spending all your energy in doing this over here. You don't have time and energy to do that over there. So the question is, what's the most important thing? What is your goal? Question number one, what is God's goal for, for our Christmas celebration? What is God's goal? If you're a Christ follower, what is God's goal for, for your Christmas celebration? What does he want? Why did he do what he, do? he, what he did? If you're not a believer, I want you to know that this whole Christmas story is another invitation, another yearly invitation to you to say no matter what you've done, have you had enough of this yet? Because I want to save you and I want to lead you. I pray that, that if you're not a believer, that you finally make the decision to follow Jesus. The rest of this world will not satisfy you. It's empty. Oh, you'll make a new goal and you'll think that's it until you get there and you realize it wasn't. God's goal for you at Christmas season is to again hear the message. And for those of you who are believers, it's not just to bring people to Christmas Eve, although I think that would be great for you to decide that to do that. It's going to be you sharing what Jesus has meant to you. Maybe it's a letter you write. You share your testimony. Question number one, what is God's goal for your Christmas? Question number two, am I and my children and grandchildren getting the Lord's message by the way we are currently doing it? When you look at your Christmas and go, if this is God's goal, how we're doing it, what, what's the real outcome? I, I gotta tell you, my, we, every year we spend a lot of time and energy. We, we, uh, we dress up and, and do the, the, the manger scene and the shepherding scene. We do that every year. And uh, every year I get to be a different character. To tell you where I was with my wife last year, she, she made me be the donkey. <laughs> she said, you've been being a donkey this, this, uh, this uh, season. So guess what? You're the donkey. <laughs> we do this every year. We try to do this. And yet it, it, we, we gotta, uh, sometimes we forget that the world and the pressure and all those things are even impacting little minds. Uh, I have this uh, four-year-old, just four-year-old little granddaughter, and uh, her name's Ellie, and, and uh, Laura and I were talking about, you know, we, we think we do pretty good, but let's, let's just make sure. So Lori, uh, the other day, said, hey, Ellie, what is Christmas about? And Ellie, four years old, went, presents! <laughs> and we were like, oh my goodness, this is... This is a hard, this is a, you just gotta keep beating the drum, don't you? Because that sinful monster inside of them and, and the world and all the kids and what are you getting? And what, and okay, how do we, it's, it's constant work. You can never take it for granted. You can never step back. You just gotta know that's just how it is. You're not a failure, you just gotta do it again. Just gotta do it again. Just gotta keep doing it again. So Lori said, well, what do you think Jesus wants? It's really Jesus' birthday. What does Jesus want? And she said, I think he wants a big stuffy. We got to talk about, no, what Jesus really wants is your heart. Are you, the, the Christmas you're currently having, is it a celebration that shows your heart for God and it impresses it upon your children? Third question, 
What, what, uh, what needs to change for my family to receive this, for me to do my part? What needs to change? What, what are those changes? In our life group this next week, we're talking about different ideas. Some people have eliminated Santa at all, at all together. Some people have said, we're all gonna draw names and just do a present, one present that each person gets so we're not financially crippling ourselves. Uh, some people are doing a birthday cake for Jesus. That's one of the things that Lori and I have done for years. Uh, the, uh, the, the calendar, the advent calendar, the, the season, what movies could we watch that, uh, that reveal the importance of what Jesus did and how he changed his lives? What are, the, what are the things we can do during this season to make sure at the end of it, our energy our energy was focused towards important things. And we maybe eliminated some of the things that cause stress and ongoing frustration. Now again, is that entirely possible? No, wherever there's people, there's problems waiting to happen. I always say this, wherever I go, there I am and my, I'm my biggest problem. But as we prayerfully consider this Christmas. What do you want it to look like? What do you want to have accomplished? What do you want to have used that time, energy, and effort on? Something that's temporary, that doesn't mean all that much, or something that's life-changing, that changes eternity? I think that's what Jesus wants to give us for Christmas. A gift to us to remember what he did so that we can defeat our enemy and make it to the finish line. Our internal enemy, the cultural enemy, the spiritual enemy. And we can get there with those we love, crossing the finish line together. We're gonna take communion together and this is a celebration, a weekly celebration Profound. God moved it, the, the uh, uh, Passover celebration, which was done once a year, to a weekly celebration. Why? Well, because he knows how often we forget. We get to remember what Jesus came to do. I hope that this is a communion service that you can participate in in this way. If you've never received Jesus, today could be the day where you say yes to him and you're obedient to him and you allow us to share with you what, is it, what it means to become a disciple of Jesus. And for those of you who are believers, I'm praying that for a moment, your eyes are taken off the television, off the, uh, the computer, what you're trying, shopping and scrolling and what this person needs and that person needs. And for a moment, you remember what we all truly need and God provided. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for what you intended it to be. Help us to find balance. There's nothing wrong with fun, Lord. You, you like for us to have fun. But there are moments where we need clarity. You, you gave us something so important for this season, and we need it now more than ever. 